Good morning, everybody. Welcome here to the people watching online. Thank you for joining us. Our verse today comes from 1 John 4. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. God is love. I hope we remember that in our everyday lives. When I see everybody excited in the back there talking, I, I feel like we love each other. And I hope we keep that in mind all the time. We have a special treat today. SBC is here. You've probably seen their table at the back. If you didn't see it on the way in, make sure you see it on the way out. Stop and talk to them. Take some information there. The Ignite team is going to be doing our praise and worship. And Professor Terry Kaufman will be speaking on Outfitted for Spiritual Success, Ephesians 6 and 2 Timothy 3. So let's look forward to those things and make sure we greet them on the way out. We have a lot of activities in the church this week. We have ladies' coffee, we have youth, grief share, and wings night. So if you've never gone to any one of those things, consider checking them out. There's always a good time of fellowship there, and we get to meet some people outside of the church, outside of church hours. We have seniors' FOSPA today, family FOSPA next week, and there's also a radio ministry tour coming about in April. So if you're interested in that, talk to Corny. Uh, some of the people from our conference churches, from Presbyterian, from Winkler, from Steinbach, from Niverville, are going to South America to promote our radio ministry, have some music nights there, things like that, and spread the gospel. So there's still a chance for you to take part in that. You can talk to Corny Dirksen. There's also a new church directory. We've been giving some advertisements for this for a while. So in the past, we had tried to get everybody's information and assemble it in a book, and that took quite a bit of time, sometimes by the time we got that book published, there was already a few people that had changed addresses and stuff like that. So now we have an app, and that app can be printed into a book, but we can update that in real time. It'd be good to get your information in, your mailing address, your birthdays and stuff like that, so we can make you uncomfortable, and then we can celebrate those things together. So talk to Maddie about that, and we want to get those in by the end of the month. The missionaries of the week are John Wheeler and the radio ministry, so you can listen to those radio broadcasts in Low German on AM 1250 on Mondays at 9.30. Under the donations, you'll see we took in a little over 11000 last week, including some of the rent. So praise God for that. Thank you for being generous. We had a, a membership meeting a few weeks ago, and you see the minutes in your mailbox today, and you can get the full financial update from there. But so far, our donations are matching our expenses. So thank you for your generosity. And then we see quite a few names on the prayer list. Um, I want to point out Diane Funk. She's going for knee replacement surgery on Tuesday. So let's uh, remember these people in our prayers and pray that it goes well. Let's bow. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful, warm February day where we can gather here with our family and friends and worship you. Lord, you've given us so much and we have things so good. And we look at these, uh, the list of ministry opportunities and we don't even take advantage of all of them, but they're all there. Lord, we see all these people on the prayer list that we could visit, that we, can, um, that we share lives with, and we take them for granted. Lord, and I ask that as we go through this next week and as we think on your word today, that we remember the blessings that you've given us. Lord, we have it so good here. We're not worried about starving. We're not worried about sleeping out in the cold. And we don't want to take these many blessings for granted because many people are worried about these things. Lord, I look at the prayer list and I, I ask that you be with each and every one of these people and also the people that are not on the prayer list. Lord, if this were a true list, everybody's name would be on here because we're all dealing with something and you know what those things are before we even ask. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us and pray that you help us to be faithful back to you in return. Lord, please... Uh, let our minds, uh, release our minds from the stresses in our lives that today we can focus on the singing that the Ignite team is going to be doing with us, focus on the message, and leave here inspired, ready to do good works for you during the week. Lord, thank you for the donations. Thank you for the ministry that goes on here. It truly is a pleasure to serve. Thank you for everything. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. ready to take the next step? At Steinbeck Bible College, your enrollment is about so much more than an education. Here, you'll join a family of students and professors who are close-knit, caring, and constantly growing. Come to chase your big questions. 
to dive into deep discussions, to search for God's voice, to take your leap of faith. We're inviting you to live in Christ-centered community with like-minded young people, to grow a biblical foundation from passionate staff who truly care about you, to learn and experience life together in a way that goes far beyond a classroom education. You might be surprised by the people you meet and experiences you find at Steinbach Bible College. Your mission starts here. Are you ready? How are you doing this morning? Are you excited to be at church? It's a wonderful day. We're happy to be here. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Melissa Duick, and I am the director of this lovely group of young men and women called Ignite. And we go around to churches, and we just have the awesome honor of leading you in worship and singing and hopefully blessing you. We pray that you'll be encouraged today by the songs and what you're hearing in the messages from these students. So I will pass it along to them. Again, this is, this is Ignite, and their first number today is Come to the Table. We all start on the outside, the outside looking in. This is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were in. And just when all hope seemed lost, Love opened the door for us. He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits, these liars and these thieves. There's no one unwelcome here. And that silly shame that you brought with you, you can leave it at the door. And let mercy draw you near. So come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come to the table. To the thief and to the doubter, to the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who fail, you've been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer, all who love and lost another, all the chained and all the free, all who follow, all who lead, anyone who's been let down, all the lost you have been found, all who labeled right or wrong, to anyone who hears this song. Come to the table, come join the sinners who have been redeemed, take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come to the table. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Annika. This is my second year being part of Ignite. Uh, one of the things that has been so impactful for me about SBC is we get to do chapel every single morning throughout the entire week. So it's a chance to worship with our student body throughout the entire week, which is awesome. So we get to come here and worship with you, which is also pretty incredible. So we have a congregational set prepared for you. So I'd love to ask you guys to stand with us and join us in worship together. because of what you did on the cross, the greatest thing that you ever did. Let us never forget it. Amen. In the darkness we 
were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Spirit, be in 
voices. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. for it. Amen. Thank you for worshiping us. You can have a seat. Now we're going to take a minute to introduce ourselves so you can get to know us a little bit better. Uh, my name is Annika. I'm in my second year at SBC. I'm doing a worship focus. Uh, I come from Niverville, Manitoba. And one fun fact about me is that I don't like cheesecake, which a lot of people have fought me on. Um, and you can fight me on it too if you want after the service. <laughs> Hi, my name is Akira Brown. I am from Zoda, Manitoba, and I'm also in my, or I'm in my first year. Um, and one thing about me is I'm actually part of a all-family worship band, and we lead worship at our church. My name is Crystal, and I'm from Spit Lake, Manitoba, passed by Thompson, and I'm also an SBC student, second year. And one thing about me, one I heard about, is that I give great hugs. So that's really interesting. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Jonathan Lowen. Uh, I'm a first year at SBC. I come from Rosenart, Manitoba. And yeah, this last year I took part in the SBC drama and I played four different roles. Hi there, my name is Bridger Dick and I'm a third year at Steinbeck Bible College. I'm graduating this year. And I'm also from Steinbeck here. Um, but I grew up overseas, and I've flown in over 150 different airplane rides. Hello, everyone. My name's Mark Forden. Uh, I'm from Thompson, Manitoba, and I'm also a first year at Steinbeck, and first year in Ignite as well. And so one of my, one of my interests would be outdoor activities. They would consist of, uh, you know, snowmobiling, wood hauling, and also I love the winter, and so... Hi, I'm Julia Dick from Gretna, Manitoba. I'm a second year in the Marketplace program, second year in Ignite. And if I'm not doing homework or hanging out with friends, you can find me in the gym coaching volleyball and basketball for Steinbeck Christian School. My name is Kendra Wall. I'm a first year at SBC, and I'm from St. Pierre, Manitoba. Um, I also love playing sports, and you'll find me in the gym too, playing basketball, volleyball, um, or tackle rugby. My name is Tanika. I'm from a small native community up north called Nelson House. I'm in my second year of SBC and my first year of Ignite, and I also like the outdoors, mostly camping and hunting on my father's trap line. Hi, my name is Charlene Fenner. I'm from Thompson, Manitoba, up north as well. Um, I'm in my second year of college and second year of Ignite. Um, fun fact about me is, uh, I've been working at Midway Bible Camp since I was 12, so. Hello, good morning, my name is Ruth Dick, and um, I'm in my third year of a four-year degree at SBC. Um, I'm here with my husband today. So when I don't have one foot in Steinbach or in Riverton, Manitoba, which is where we live, it's north of Gimli, on the way to Hecla, and um, I have one foot in Africa, and I also have a grandbaby in Germany. So get to do lots of traveling.
beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought to share. The next song we're going to do is called Scars. There are many reasons we might carry scars. Tough life circumstances that bring change, grief, loss, crisis, and trauma. In our lives, they leave us wounded and scarred. The more I understand the gospel of Jesus and why he lived, died, and was resurrected, the more I grow in courage to accept and acknowledge that this life is just messy and will wound me. I do have scars. We all have scars. They're a part of our stories. I wonder, can any of you relate to some of the scars that I carry? Sickness, car accident, loss of innocence, betrayal, abandonment, bully, deaths, deaths of relationships, <clears throat> Dear friends, grandparents, a father, a miscarriage, losses that surround hopes and dreams. As we sing this song, you'll he hear the words, I'm thankful for the scars. Can you reflect with thankfulness as we sing on some of your scars? Are you thankful that Jesus was there with you? 
he brought you through for what you have learned. Maybe you have a painful wound that you are ready to accept and allow Jesus to clean and heal as you acknowledge it in your life. Justice, salvation, and relationship was made available to us through Jesus. Scars in his life and death. There is purpose in the suffering that produces scars in us too. Purpose in drawing us to Jesus and eventually Jesus ministering through us to others as a result of those scars. Thank you so much, Ignite, for leading us in worship and ministering to us. 
I, I have to say that I'm, I'm honored and proud to be here with this team today. And uh, it is really good. I also want to say, Annika, for the record, those who say to you it's wrong for you not to like cheesecake, they're wrong. <laughs> not because cheesecake isn't great, but the more people that don't like it mean there's more pieces for the rest of us who do, right? You know, so... Um, I'm very glad to be here with you this morning, whether you're here uh, in the sanctuary or online. Uh, my name is Terry Kaufman, as was mentioned. My wife Peggy and I have lived in Steinbach now for almost 20 years. We have two married children and one grandson. He's going to be five. If you're a grandparent, you know how amazing that is. Um, and how amazing grandchildren are. Uh, he's going to be five in, in two weeks. Uh, I do have him enrolled in SBC for next fall because he's just, that's, you know. Um, some of you may be aware I was senior preaching pastor at Emmanuel EFC here in Steinbach for over 16 years. And then in 2020, I took a position with the Evangelical Free Church of Canada doing leadership development. I work with pastors and boards all across Canada. And then I added to that my teaching role at Steinbeck Bible College. And I am privileged to be part-time there. My area there is marketplace and ministry leadership. So in addition to doing, talking about leadership in the context of ministry, in addition to being able to, to do some preaching classes, um, I get to oversee our marketplace ministry. And, and the big thing about marketplace ministry is that we recognize, and I'm sure all of you do too, that ministry is not exclusive to positions in the church. It's universal. For all believers. So we, we talk with students about what, what it's going to look like for them as they step out of, of SBC, as they end up being teachers or healthcare workers or lawyers or carpenters or whatever they end up being and, and what that looks like to be a minister of the gospel in those contexts. So uh, we're, I'm, I'm excited about that. I also get to do some, uh, some community or some, some efforts to help the larger church um, we're going to do a workshop series, actually four evenings of workshops starting in about a month. Um, and, and the topic is actually, this is my quick uh, description, it's on, on church and family hurt and healing. Basically, we're going to talk about the question, will the hurt and the awkwardness ever stop? Because we, we, we carry hurts. We carry hurts, Ruth talked a little bit about that when she introduced the song for us. And, um, you know, can we get past those? What does it mean? So we're going we're gonna, to, uh, as an SBC group, we're talking about that. And uh, your, your church will get more information on that shortly. Lots of great things going on at SBC. And, of course, the big one uh, for many of us is our new president. We are so excited about Dave Reimer. And I actually want to say thank you to you as a church and to the CMC overall for your gifting and your sharing of Dave with SBC and with the larger Christian community. Um, you are blessing us. I doubt that he actually gave all of you a vote. So you can't take credit in that, but I know that you are coming alongside and encouraging and blessing him as he comes. And I have been down the same road as Dave is on right now a couple of times where I've left a local church for a denominational ministry or, or something like that. And I know how important the blessing of the church is. And I am so excited personally about Dave coming. He is going to help Steinbach Bible College train leaders for God's church and for the community. And this team that's been ministering to us this morning, they're reflective of the kind of leaders that God has been blessing SBC with. So your investment, your support, your sending of young leaders is so really important and appreciated. Investing in young leaders is essential. Because Young leaders, people, people stepping into to roles of, of leadership in the homes, in businesses, in the churches, ah, boy, they got a job ahead of them. They got a road ahead of them. When we look at the world around us, right, our world is full of, of challenge, it's full of uncertainty, uh, and, and, and sometimes young people today are faced with, with issues, I'll be honest, I wasn't even aware they were issues until I was in my 30s and 40s. And some of them weren't. 
And that, well, yeah, unfortunately, that was a few years ago. Their journey is full of some pretty hard climbing. But you know what? (laughs) Great heights and beautiful scenery is usually only achieved with some hard climbing. A lot of us have experienced that in one way or another in our lives. And I anticipate these, peop- these young people, these young leaders, and, and the others at SBC, I anticipate them reaching great heights. In fact, I want you to imagine with me for just a moment that you were going on a climb, okay? And I'm talking about a real climb, not Abe's Hill, okay? That doesn't really count. Um, I, I want you to think about some kind of really big climb. Okay, something bigger than normal, maybe a mountain path. Uh, in, in, in two weeks, my wife and I are taking our, our son and daughter-in-law to Phoenix for, for a week. And, and if you've been to Phoenix, there's a place at Phoenix called Camelback. And uh, Camelback is this mountain, and you, get to, you, you can hike this mountain. And, and if you're following the trail up one side of the mountain, they actually have iron railings set into the rock because the, the path is so treacherous. And difficult. And, and at times when you're walking on that path, it's like you're walking on a knife edge and there's just down on both sides. And we might actually do camelback when we're there. Full disclosure, we'll come from the other side of the mountain that is the old person tourist path, not the, the really, you know, hard one. But just picture for, for yourself what, a, a path like that. And, and let me then ask this. If you were to go on a hike like that, some kind of, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It's maybe precarious and treacherous and dangerous. Uh, what are some of the things you would think about when you're preparing to go on that journey? Well, as I think about Camelback, I think about the month or two of training I should have done before I went down there in the first place. I think about, will there be good access to medical care? Because I might need that. And I have to admit, another thought that might come is, could I actually do this hike through virtual reality while sitting in a living room somewhere? Um, But, you know, really, we'll, we'll be sure to take water, sunscreen, a hat, maybe a walking stick, a GPS, a camera. But one thing is certain in thinking about a, a big journey like that. I would carefully consider my footwear. I would carefully consider what I put on my feet. The shoes you choose are pretty important when when you're facing some kind of an uphill and hard climb. Anybody here willing to admit that they're a shoe person, period, like overall? Oh, nobody's willing. Oh, yeah, okay, we've got one one honest person here. Um, I know that there's more of you. People love shoes. Often, right? Shoes for any occasion. Some for protection, some for comfort, some for style, some for walking, some for house, some for outdoors, some for black and gray and brown and actually four shades of brown, red, blue, green, right? Well, whether or not you're a shoe person, on a serious climb, you become a shoe person, right? And you know what? Spiritual climbing... Getting to the high heights spiritually, getting to the places of God's blessing and the beautiful scenery of God's blessing also requires the same kind of thought and preparation and equipping. I could talk about how SBC is a place where we work to help with that, and I think the students here are witness to that. But I want to challenge all of us today to think about this because every single one of us are in the midst of some kind of a climb. Some kind of a climb spiritually. And we want to move forward. We want to move up, don't we? Spiritually. And it's a calling that we all get. Student, teacher, working, retired, old, young, all of us. Paul wrote to the Christians, all of them, at Philippi, and and he said, I am straining towards what is ahead. It's work. And if you want to experience a mountaintop kind of victory, which might look different for all of us, you're going to need to do some hard work of tackling the mountain and doing the walk. So the key question then becomes, what do you need to do to be able to make the climb? And I want us to start thinking about that this morning by looking at Ephesians chapter 6, where we have a picture actually where 
footwear is connected with spiritual equipping. Ephesians 6, you're probably mostly familiar with this. Ephesians 6 is mostly about being strong in the Lord. And the word picture isn't about hiking specifically. Ephesians chapter 6 lists six pieces of battle armor and then it adds prayer kind of as the overarching seventh. And one of those pieces of armor is footwear. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to start at verse 14. If you have Bibles with you, you might want to open them or turn them on. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 14. This is what Paul writes. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Feet that are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. It's part of this armor that Paul talks about here. It's part of the equipping to face the difficulties ahead of us. And, and it's put in, in, in this group of six alongside of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and the belt of truth. Half of the pieces of armor have to do with words, with truth, with the gospel, with this. Half of them. Ephesians 6 isn't alone in emphasizing that, though. It continues an emphasis that just kind of permeates through the New Testament. An emphasis on the place of the Word of God in our lives. And that's what I want to speak to this morning. Because if we are going to journey, if we are going to climb, if we are going to move ahead, we need the Word of God. This comes as no surprise to you, I'm sure. So it's not going to be profound in that sense, but I trust it will be encouraging to you in the journeys you are on. And we see that same emphasis not just in, in the, the, the teaching that we find in the New Testament, we see it in the examples we find in the New Testament. Paul is often our go-to guy for many things spiritual. He's a good example for us. In Acts chapter 11, we're told he's teaching with Barnabas. In the first verses of Acts chapter 13, we're told that he's actually set apart and sent to teach and that he proclaimed the word of God. Later on in that same chapter, it says he used the scripture to explain the gospel. In Acts chapter 17, he reasons with the philosophers of the day from the scriptures. We could go on, but Paul isn't the only example. I want to take you back to the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 4, and I'm actually going to read a, a good chunk of verses here because I think it, it, it emphasizes something really, really powerful for us in terms of the place of God's word in our lives. Luke chapter 4, again a familiar story. This is the story of Jesus being tested in the wilderness. I'm going to read the first 12 verses. This is how the story goes. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worthy is the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, this is interesting because Satan's catching on to something here. <laughs> he doesn't handle it right. But he says, it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus keeps saying, it is written. Pretty clear that he is anchored in the word of God. There are so many lessons in this story, but here's a big one. 
Friends, if you are going to fight the lies of the enemy, if you're going to fight the lies and the temptations and the tests of Satan, you need the Word of God in you. You need the Word of God in you. Some of us need to stop and just kind of take that sentence in because we're daily battling with lies from Satan. Lies that say you're worthless. Lies that say God doesn't care. Lies that says God can't. Lies that say you aren't loved or that sin doesn't matter or you're never going to get past this or you're too old to be of any good or you don't need to grow and learn. The list of lies is long. But to see them as lies and to call them out and to stand against them, you need the word of God in you. Jesus' example shows us that. This, this, this story is so amazing to me because do you not think that Jesus could have just said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I am Jesus. I'm the Messiah. I am God the Son. I am the Son of God. Satan, shut up. He could have done that. He could have said that. But he didn't. Instead, he quotes Scripture. Verse 1 of Luke chapter 4 tells us that Jesus was, was full of the Holy Spirit. And I put those together and it, it kind of makes me think that if we are full of the Holy Spirit, it also then means we will be full of the Word of God. At least we should be. And if we are, I like to think about it this way, if we are full of the Holy Spirit and full of the Word of God, when we get bumped, what happens and what spills out? The Word of God. Satan comes against Jesus and he does this. And what spills out? The Word of God. If that was Jesus' strategy, why wouldn't we follow it? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, did this. He, he, he made sure that he was full of the Word of God. Paul did. Let me draw your, draw your attention to one other example. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it says this. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Paul taught the Bereans, and we don't know exactly, you know, did they take notes as Paul was preaching? I, I, I don't know how they did it, but we know that together they checked him out against the word of God. Now you've got to remember, they've got Paul as their teacher. This is the Apostle Paul. And these people sitting listening to him are saying, okay, Paul said that, but we're going to check it against the word of God. No matter how good the speaker, no, no matter how good the source. Because it isn't just about the teacher. Friends, it's about getting into the word personally yourselves and getting the word into you personally. Here's a question for you to ponder. When you listen to or you read a Christian speaker, an author, a preacher, a yeah, Bible college professor... Do you measure his or her words against the word of God and the full counsel of the word of God? I admit, in my many years of ministry, I've been involved in ministry directly for over 30 years now and active in a church as a lay, uh, in, in lay ministry before that. So many times I've seen people who will pick up the latest book and read it and it all sounds so good, so inviting, so encouraging and they just swallow it up without checking it against the word of God. In fact, many of us spend an awful lot of time listening peop to people who talk about the Bible and sometimes we spend more time listening to them or reading them than we do reading the Bible itself. I also see people who basically ignore the word of God and then they say, God, I'm looking for a message. I'm looking, I'm looking for you to tell me what to do. And God's saying, I've told you. Are you paying attention to what I've already said? 
I'm not saying God doesn't speak in other ways. He certainly does. But our default, our starting point, our authority needs to be the word of God. Peter, as he was writing, said, We have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it. It's the pattern we see in Scripture. Followers of Jesus immersing themselves in the word of God. And Jesus led by example. Friends, we cannot minimize, we cannot shortcut the role of the Bible in our lives as followers of Jesus. It's part of our journey. It's part of our preparation. And all of this is connected to being fitted with the gospel of peace and taking up the sword of the Spirit. But that's not the only word picture that the Bible has about the word of God. I I invite you to, to flip over in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 1 Timothy chapter 4. I want to look at just one verse from 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. As Peter is writing to this young pastor, Timothy, uh, he, he says this. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Nourished on the truths of the faith and the good teaching. Paul's saying here that what's required of a pastor teacher is to be nourished on those truths and on that teaching. But this letter was included in God's word for all of us, so it's not exclusive in its call to pastors. It's for all of us. And I think there's a really important insight here about us and God's word and how it equips us for the journey we are on. It's found, this insight is found in a, in a single word in this verse. You see, The Bible, the teaching, the truths of the faith. The Bible isn't just about aha moments. It is about steady, ongoing feeding. And Paul uses the word nourished. Nourished. And you know there's a difference between nourishment and flavor or savor? Our society is obsessed with taste with flavor, right? And, and quite honestly, we battle against eating for taste. You know, it tastes so good, I want to eat more of it because we know that at the end of the day, that's really not a healthy approach. The truth is that we need to eat not just for flavor, but also for nourishment, right? I know that's a little oversimplified, but you're smart enough to figure it out. Let me ask you to think for a minute about what would make your list of best tasting foods. For Annika, it wouldn't be cheesecake. That's fine. My list, I love burgers and fries, I admit it. I love a good steak, chocolate cream pie, coffee, chocolate, ice cream, pizza, my wife's fresh homemade bread. But, Because I know nourishment is also an issue, I change my menu and I add some fruit pies into the menu. (laughs) Actually, a few other things too, but here's the point. You know, it's not healthy just to eat for taste alone. I remember this was about 35 years ago. I was in business at the time. My wife and I were very active in our church and we invited a, a young family to our home for dinner. A mom and a dad, they had one son, and my wife did this meal. It was roast beef, fresh Yorkshire pudding, gravy, mashed potatoes. It was fabulous. Your son wasn't eating anything. And the parents described, well, you know, really, he only likes KD, craft dinner. So my wife got out a pot, and she made him craft dinner so he would eat something, because otherwise he would have eaten nothing. That poor boy looked anemic and sick because he was allowed just to eat for his taste and not for nourishment. You know, taste is not the purpose of food. Nourishment is. And if we are going to be strong enough to actually climb and and move forward and push ahead, like Paul says, we need to be nourished, not just taste buds satisfied. Preparing for that climb up Camelback, I'll probably also throw in a protein bar, maybe a little bit of fruit, some kind of nourishment. Here's my point as I return to 1 Timothy 4, 
We need to use the Word of God as nourishment, not just something to tickle our taste buds. It's nourishment that strengthens and carries the body physically and spiritually. The Bible is not just a magic pill that solves the problem of the day. The Bible is where we find sustained, faithful nourishment that will strengthen us. It will train us in righteousness. It will lead us in obedience. It will thoroughly equip us for every good work. So that every time we're bumped, it's God's word that spills out. Because that's what I hear the Bible saying it's all about. I want to challenge you today, more, more accurately probably just encourage you to continue to think about your intake of the word of God like this. Be less concerned about looking for zing or flavor or savor and more concerned with looking for nourishment and for strength. Martin Luther once said, Most necessary is that we know the gospel well, teach it to others, and beat it into their heads continuously. I'm not sure the last part there is really the choice of words or pictures I would use, but, but Luther, who tended to be a little bit earthy, he knew that we have this proclivity to wander from nourishment to junk food. Anybody here think that their life is busy? Yeah, lots of us. And some of you who didn't put your hands up, it has been busy. You're in a different chapter in life, and maybe it isn't quite as busy. What happens to our diet when life is busy? We tend to dine on fast food and processed food, not necessarily nutritious food, right? Do you know the same can be true spiritually? And I'm afraid that many people today are fast-fooding the Bible open it up and find one verse quickly to, oh, it's a good encouraging verse for today, now I'm off to go. Okay, that's good. That's important. And the Bible does that. But we need to dig deeper, friends. We need to dig deeper if we're going to truly be nourished. Jesus knew how essential it was. Paul knew how essential it was. The Bereans knew how essential it was. So what does this look like? To be nourished by the word, to be fitted with the message of the gospel. Let me suggest a couple of basics, maybe as a starting place. First, the model of biblical nourishment we see in Acts and in the early church includes corporate teaching. And you are here in part to worship. You are also in part to put yourself under the teaching of the word of God. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about preachers being invited to the church to serve the purpose of maturing people in Christ's likeness. As Paul was writing again to Timothy, he says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to the preaching and the teaching. One author put it like this, The proclamation of Scriptures is God's primary means for a disciple of Jesus to grow in spiritual maturity. When a professing Christian misses church, they are missing God's prescribed process for spiritual growth. Oh, some of us, and I've heard this question, might ask, well, why do I need to do that today? You know, in, in, in Paul's day, the people in the church wouldn't have had their own Bible. They wouldn't have each had their own Bible. I've got my own Bible. Why do I need to listen to somebody else talk about the Bible well, left to our own devices, we often misread. We sometimes misunderstand. Corporate teaching of the Bible has always been, and I believe always will be, part of God's plan for us. I read an article recently about preaching, and it likened preaching to, to uh, different kinds um, of, of food, of meal types. And the author said this, non-gourmet, home-cooked, healthy meal might not win a prize or get attention, but it will, over time, generate health. In a British weekly called The Glass Window, this was a number of years ago, there was a letter that was published, a letter to the editor of this British weekly, and the letter went like this. It seems ministers feel their sermons are very important and spend a great deal of time preparing them. I've been attending church quite regularly for 30 years, and I have probably heard 3,000 of them. To my consternation, I've discovered I cannot remember a single sermon. 
I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitably spent on something else. Well, apparently for weeks, uh, there was a storm of editorial responses back and forth and back and forth on this, uh, responding to this letter until it finally ended with another letter that was submitted. And this is what the final letter said. I've been married for 30 years. During that time, I've eaten 32,850 meals, mostly my wife's cooking. Suddenly, I've discovered I can't remember the menu of a single meal. And yet, I have the distinct impression that without them, I would have starved to death long ago. I received nourishment from every single meal. We need to sit under the nourishing of the teaching of God's Word. But secondly, we do also need to get into the Word personally. As Paul is writing to Timothy, he is saying to him, Get into the Word, young man. You personally. There are people who need to move beyond Sundays, beyond sermons. We all have Bibles. Would we be embarrassed if somebody knew how much we actually opened the Bible at home and dug into it on our own? I used to tell my church family at Emmanuel this quite often, that the sermon, no matter how good it is, how bad it is, how important it is, it is a primer to get you into the Word. Thirdly, I think we need to do this together with others. We need group interaction. Brian's Brian's example, that great, they examined the word daily. They wouldn't have had Bibles, each and every one of them, but it doesn't matter. They gathered together and talked about it, and that's how we learn how to apply the word of God. And then fourthly, we need to see that the Bible never allows us to separate learning from doing. Jesus himself said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Friends, we need, we need to get into God's Word. And we need to get God's Word into us. And all of that together, sitting under the teaching of God's Word, looking at it yourself, digging into it, meditating on it, talking about it with others, and actually practicing what it says. It's all part of a healthy spiritual diet. So, I have rather briefly drawn our attention today to two word pictures that help us understand how much we need to and what we need to do to be strong and healthy and safe as we face life's challenges, those mountain kinds of experiences and journeys. We need to pay attention to our footwear. You don't wear high heels to hike a mountain. It isn't all about what things look like. Spiritual equipping also is not about style. It's about substance and effectiveness and keeping us safe. And then, second word picture is being nourished. What are you doing to be spiritually nourished with the word of God? You know, you would never spend a whole month eating nothing but Snickers bars and then expect to feel great and strong enough to climb a mountaintop. We need to continue to fill up on nutritional, spiritual food. I'm going to close with this. Paul was no commanding presence. He wasn't six foot four. We don't know exactly how tall he was, but studies kind of believe he was on the shorter side. He was certainly not six foot four. He didn't wear a power suit. He didn't have perfect hair and a great big smile. His power was not in his presence. Do you know what his power was in? It was in the Word of God that was in him and through him. And you know what's amazing and wonderful? That same Word of God can be in you and working through you. Each and every one of you. Do you want to be spiritually healthy and strong and fit? Get into the Word. Not just for the flavor of the day, but for nourishment. Dive in. Read. And devour. Friends, let's be like Paul, like the Brians, like Jesus. It is now and always has been so important to be nourished, not just curious and interested in God's Word, but to be nourished in it, to intentionally put on the gospel, to equip ourselves with the Word of God before we ever step out the door to face whatever the day holds. My prayer for all of us today 
is that we would be encouraged to keep doing that. That's going to make us spiritually strong. We are going to be able to climb those mountains and experience the blessing of God and achieve what he has for us. May that be your continuing story. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father God, your word is so rich to us. It has given us all we need for life and for faith. Admittedly, there are times we go to it looking for answers to questions that, well, sometimes it's hard to find those answers there. But the truth of the matter is, there is enough. There is more than enough. And you've given us all of this to feed us, to strengthen us. And Lord Jesus, you gave us the example of doing exactly that. Being so full of the word of God that it spills out in the tough times. Father, it's my prayer that that will be true of each and every one in this building and watching online. And that we would understand how, how absolutely essential that is and it would give us a great hunger for your word, a great desire, and at times the discipline to keep pushing in, digging and learning and growing and being strengthened by the power of your spirit at work in us. Knight is going to sing one more song to close us, but I'm going to ask you to bow or continue to stay bowed for a benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.
I just want to say uh, thank you for letting us come and sing for you guys today. I hope you feel blessed. Um, if you want to learn more about SBC, we've got a booth in the back. And yeah, have a great day.